Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment, the show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And we are maybe halfway through our summer of the microbiome. So if you are unaware, we've been doing microbiome stuff all summer. We did two episodes on a conference that we went to in the spring. But still to come is we're going to talk about our own microbiomes. That's right. We sampled our own poops, got a sequence, and we're going to analyze it and give it to you and let you know whether or not it's worth doing your own sampling of the microbiome. So in that process, we did Zoe and we did Biome, and we will be talking about both of those things with you guys and what we learned and what we liked, what we didn't like, which one we think is best, what are the differences in the way they analyze your microbiome and what sort of information you can glean from it. So if you would like to hear those episodes, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode with all of your friends. So on social media, we often like to share birthdays of famous microbiologists, of famous people who contributed to the field of microbiology. So if that information's interesting to you, go find us at Microbigales on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, we post those every month. There's usually three or four. But when I was doing it for July, I noticed something sort of interesting that you could basically tell the whole history of microbial genomics up until microbiome analysis through birthdays, through famous peoples who were born in the month of July and or the beginning of August. So since I was born in July, does that mean I'm going to be a famous microbiologist? You already are a famous microbiologist in my eyes. Aww. Aww. So adorable. It's gross. So gross. Anywho... So today we will be talking about those July birthdays. So if you have a birthday in July and you are a microbiologist, maybe you have a higher probability of becoming a famous or contributing to microbial genomics. Think about it. Might be right for you. Well, I'm in the microbiome field, so. Great. You're, you're on your way. And for any other listeners, you're on your way, too. So before we get into it, in case you haven't listened to any of our other podcasts this summer and you have no idea what the microbiome is, let me give you a really brief primer. If you are already up to date on all that stuff, go ahead and skip forward. All right. So the microbiome is all the microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses, plasmids, protists, the list goes on and on and their genes that are usually associated with humans. So a microbiome exists on anything, really, but generally when we are talking about the microbiome, because we are egotistic, we are talking about humans. And generally, that gets even more niche, we are generally talking about the gut microbiome. And generally, to even go further into that, we are just talking about bacteria. So that really just shows you how narrow the niche of microbiome is. And there's still so much to learn. So when you encapsulate that, we have to study bacteria, fungi, viruses, protists, and all of their genes and all of the environments and everything that has a host, you can definitely see how we have room for future microbial genomic experts in the future. So we, we generally believe that bacteria are contributing the most to the gut microbiome. And they contribute in ways such as stimulating the immune system, breaking down toxic food, synthesizing your vitamins, particularly vitamin B and K, and protecting from pathogens. And this can either be directly or indirectly, where directly might be they re the your good microbes or your beneficial microbes might release something that is antagonistic to a pathogen, effectively not allowing them to grow, but it can also be something more like the microbe just saying, hey, I'm living here, you can't, and um, allowing that pathogen to just float on by because there's no space for him. But yeah, and we are generally just talking about bacteria when we're doing that. There is some research on the virome, on the mycobiome, which is an M-Y-C-O instead of M-I-C-R-O. And that's for fungi. And that's for fungi. Um, but generally, what we have information on is on bacteria. So, and the other thing I always like to say with the microbiome is I think there was, at one point, there was a paper that came out that said was you have 10 times as many microbial cells as you have human cells. But just so everyone knows, that's incredibly hard to determine. 
Um, and I'm sure like there's probably differences in the amount of cells everyone has as well. So getting that exact 10 to 1 ratio is an estimate. And there's actually more recent papers that are saying it's more likely a 1 to 1 ratio. Regardless, you are a lot of microbe. Yep. And just a little bit of human. So without further ado, let's go back to what? 1600s, 1700s? Where are we going, John? So let's first... Say, like, how are we presenting these uh, people? Is it based off of their birthdays, their discoveries? Like, how are we oh, doing this? Right. We're going chronologically based on year. So not based on the day in July, but know that most people's birthdays are in July. We're going chronologically from Robert Hooke, right? He's the mm -hmm. first one. Back to 16-something. And we're going all the way up until 1996, I believe. All right. And we'll cut it off. And there's a whole slew of stuff that happened after 1996 because we weren't even doing microbiome analysis in 1996. But that's for another day, friends. Now, as, as a caveat, there could have been two people that could have filled this spot, really, for the discovery. But I went with Robert Hooke because he's actually a lot. No, he was <laughs> fading to obscurity, actually. So let's. he was born on July 28th, 1635. And he loved microscopes and telescopes mm -hmm. and a lot, a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So he, his most famous work in biology is the book Micrographia in 1665. And he developed a compound microscope and illumination system mm -hmm. that was one of the best microscopes at the time. And he used this microscope to develop detailed illustrations and, uh, and observations, including like insects feathers and even slices of cork and he observed and coined the term cells out of this mm -hmm. they called it a cell because it of the cell wall it was encased in something it's like that's a that looks yeah. like a cell yeah makes sense now i toggle between this because this was also the time of uh lehman hook who lewin hook lewin hook who developed a lot of microscopes at the time as well and he first actually found bacteria and protozoa, which he termed little animals. Mm -hmm. And he sent his observations to the Royal Society, which Robert Hooke was a part of. And Robert Hooke had to corroborate this, and he did. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, no, so I'm going to get there first. Nope. He gave Leon Hooks his day in the sun. He didn't want to steal any of that. But I will say that this man did everything. So Robert was an English physicist whose research, I'm going to pat myself on this, stretched in many fields. I say that because he discovered the law of elasticity, <laughs> which is the stretching of a solid body is proportional to the force applied to it. One of the, he was one of the first men to build a Gregorian reflecting microscope. Gregorian? Like the calendar? Yeah. He designed bound springs for watches, worked on improving the pendulum clock. He was a professor of geometry, suggested that Jupiter rotates on its axis, discovered light diffraction, and offered that light was a wave. And So he basically did physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, product design, yeah. instrument creation. He was also interested in fossils. And archaeology. Yeah, so he saw he saw similarities between fossils of wood and shells and current ones, and he described how something could be turned into stone, and that actually influenced the theory of evolution. Wow, he did so much, and why didn't we hear him? Well, it's said that he had a feud with Sir Isaac Newton, and that as, man. Yep, and Whatever. Isaac ever he just had a apple fall on his head. <laughs> Is it really even that big of a deal? Yeah, well, he created a whole field of math calculus. Who even like no one even <laughs> likes calculus, okay? No one likes calculus. But he built a lot some of his theories using Hooke's observations to modify his own without giving credit to him. Ooh. Due to his feud, it suggested that he buried Robert Hooke's name. What a jerk. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he discovered cells, but he discovered so much more. Yeah. He was a huge influence that no one knows of. And how does, let me tie this back. How, how does this ref, 
refer to the microbiome? Well, if he didn't do any work on cells, would we know of the microscopic world? Mm-mm. Sure, Le- uh, Leon Hook discovered bacteria and protozoa, but he needed a second opinion to verify that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Hook allowed that. So the field of microbiology would not have even existed without these two men's discovery. Yeah, and Hook didn't use his seat of power to bulldoze over people smaller than him. From what I can tell, no. Like somebody else we know. But that's why I picked Robert Hook, and I thought it was pretty cool. Mm, yeah, be a Hook, not a Newton. No one likes calculus. <laughs> so who's the next person? All right, well, we're going to go fast forward quite a bit. So we're going to talk about someone... Else, you probably have never heard of. I had never heard of him, and then I was reading about him, and I was like, pretty cool. So this is Jacob Henley. He's of German descent. He was born on July 9th, 1809. And fundamentally, he was an, an, an anatomist. Oh, that was hard to say, an anatomist. He did a ton of work in human anatomy. A piece of your kidney is actually named after him. So we all have a little bit of Jacob Henley inside of us. Oh, the loop of Henley. The loop of Henley. That's correct. You know about the loop of Henley? Yeah, it's part of the nephron, I think. That's the basic working unit of your kidney. How we filter our blood. Mm. And- well, that's why I'm not in the medical field. It's a hairpin-shaped section of the kidney, um, and as John said, it does stuff. Um, but it also concentrates your pee in a collecting duct. Yes. So that's fun. So what happens is you filter a lot of a lot of everything out in the the nephron, and Jeez. you're you're dumping a lot of stuff in the kidney through the nephron. And the loop of Henley helps reabsorb some of the stuff, so you don't become dehydrated or lose all these vitamins or electrons Mm, that's important so this loop is also found across a number of different animal divisions henley was also the person that said many human body surfaces are covered in epithelial tissue and he wrote the handbook on human anatomy at least the 19th century version the one that all anatomy books are really based off of yeah today right he did that Other discoveries of his include cylindrical epithelial cells in the intestine tract, the circular root sheath of your hair, the microscopical, microscopical, these are not even medical words, I just can't (laughs) speak, microscopical structure of the cornea. Okay. It's your eyeball. The endothelium of the blood vessels. And the structure of hepatic cells. Hepatic's your liver? Yep. Nice. So what is his micro moment then? I'm kind of curious to hear this. So in 1840, he publishes the Von den Miasmen und Contagion. I mean, obviously. Obviously. This is my German so perfect. Do you have a translation on what that is? Of course I do. It's on the Miasmata and Contagia. Which means on the on miasma and contagion is really what it is. So, in short, it pointed out that tiny microscopic organisms called contagia animata are likely the cause of many diseases. Hmm, sound hmm. familiar? This was the foundation work in moving the world away from the theory of miasma and into the theory of germ theory. That's right. Although, when he proposed it, everyone was like, "Mm, no, you're wrong. And he was all like, fine, I'll just train my very good protege, Robert Koch, on everything I say, and maybe he'll convince all you people that germs are a thing. Actually, after saying that, I do remember now his name came up in the biography of Robert Koch. That's right. Last December, we celebrated... Robert Koch's and Louis Pasteur's birthday in our two-part biocast. I like that word I just came up with. (laughs) So if you're interested in learning more about Robert Koch and the history of germ theory or Louis Pasteur and which one is better, John and I pick sides, check it out. I think in there we probably also mentioned Henley. Yes, his theory of like infection is closely corroborates to Henley's. It's Definitely a lot more detailed, but Henley was on the right track. 
Yeah, I, I mean, like when you read what Henley said, it's like eighty percent of Coke's postulates. Coke just kind of put a nice little bow on it, shipped it out, and convinced people it was a shiny package inside. I mean, he did a lot of work to figure that out, too. I mean, yeah, he did stuff. He was also smart, but, you know, sometimes we forget about the people that come before us that did the real work. We just kind of piece it together. Also, they both did important work. Oh, and I wanted to end our little segment on Henley with a quote from the Handbook of Rational Pathology, which is another thing that he wrote. He was just handbooks everywhere. So what is this quote? The day of the last hypothesis would be also the day of the last observation. An hypothesis displaced by new facts dies an honorable death. If it has itself summoned to its trial the facts by which it is annihilated, it deserves even a monument, a moment of gratitude. Wow. I like it. Super deep. Yeah. So inspirational. All right. So we're going to talk about another early microbiologist, one that I think we've talked about on the podcast at least a couple of times, although we don't have something truly dedicated to him, whether it is a podcast or a blog or, well, we definitely have a post about him. He is a very interesting character that I keep meaning to make a blog post on him, but I just haven't got that yet. He is Ukrainian or he was born in what is now Ukraine, but I think he also identified as Russian because he was born on um, the 16th of May in 1845. So this person is Eli Meshnikov, and he gets into our July-August birthday bash because I often also say death days, birthdays, both can be celebrated. He died on July 15th, 1916. So right before the Bush, 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 Bolshevik the Bush, Bush, Revolution. Yeah, that was 1917, right? Around that era, yeah. Yeah, historic dates that don't have microbial contributions are a little fuzzy in my brain. Anywho, so who was Eli Mechnikov? He is, some people can say he is the father of probiotics, which is definitely linked to microbiome, because oftentimes we're looking at microbiome, we're thinking about how the microbiome can benefit us and whether or not we have beneficial or probiotic species already living in our microbiome. So he was on top of this back in the early 20th century. In 1908, Meshnikov got won the Nobel Prize with Paul Ehrlich, Ehrlich, who might sound familiar because Paul Ehrlich did a lot of stuff with syphilis, including the salvaricin, which was a arsenic or mercury-based cure with heavy quotations of marks yeah. around it for syphilis in the early 20th century. So Eli Meshnikov and Paul Ehrlich won the Nobel Prize for something completely different than syphilis, and it was on vagocytosis. Vagocytosis mm-hmm. sells eating stuff. Yeah, so this is... Nom, 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 nom. This is a basic immune mechanism that we all have where our cells will eat other cells that they deem um, bad. And they can break them down so the cell is no longer a terrorist in your body. And he found this, which I thought was sort of interesting, in studying starfish. So phagocytosis is found in a lot of different immune systems. Arsenic. Arsenic. Salvaricin was an arsenic-derived syphilis treatment of the 20th century, which he discovered in 1906. Anywho, we're not talking about him. We're talking about Meshnikov. So it actually doesn't surprise me that phagocytosis is seen across the board because it's part of the uh, innate immune system. Right. Which is different from your adaptive immune system. Right. So this is the innate immune system. Just it's there. It's not perfect, but it's one of the first lines of defense to against any potential infections. Mm-hmm. It does it does not need to learn mm-hmm. what the infection is? It's just there, and it doesn't create antibodies. It does not. No, that doesn't do that. It just eats other cells that it thinks might be bad. Right. So that was one thing that Eli Meshnikov did, which has considerable effects to the immune system and your microbiome. But he also has another micro moment that we will get into after we talk about the tragedy of Meshnikov. What's the tragedy of Meshnikov? So this is a trigger warning for suicide. So if that's something that's triggering to you, 
fast forward maybe 30 seconds or a minute. Um, but so Menchnikov became a professor of zoology at Odessa in his early 20s, which is like, whoa, you can't become a professor today until you're like at least 30. Anyways, in his early 20s, he married Ludmia Fyodorovich. But this was a marriage that was doomed from the start because Ludmia had a very intense micro moment that was called consumption. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, correct. That was her micro moment to the point where she was so frail that on her wedding day, she had to be carried to the church in a chair because she could not walk. That's terrible. That's so sad. From the point that they got married, she did survive for five years, and it was pretty devastating for Meshnikov to be this person who studies biology, to be the zoology, be this professor at this great institution, and watch his wife slowly deteriorate. He was so driven to try to help her that when she died, he actually attempted suicide from morphine overdose, just from the heartbreak of it all. That's so sad. Yes. It gets worse. He survived this overdose of morphine. He married again, um, but the academics and the politics and the student dissent at Odessa forced him to leave the school entirely. And then he purposefully inoculated himself with a deadly bacteria that causes relapsing fever. Oh, no. Yeah, so this was his second suicide attempt. And he thought if he did it under the guise of a research experiment, which... I do not suggest it would not bring his wife and family shame because he would die of a disease and not by his own hand, quote unquote. So did he die from this? He did not. Fortunately for us, although he was frail and he was um, sickly for a long time, he did survive and he didn't attempt suicide again after that from what I've read. He did befriend Louis Pasteur, one of the greatest scientists of all time. uh, Louis Pasteur was like, hey, I know you're kind of down in your luck. You just left your school. You have all these suicide attempts. Maybe you should come over and be the head of the laboratory at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And he was like, sure, let's go do that. And so he moved to Paris and he became the head of the laboratory there at the Pasteur Institute. Now, for the true moment that... Eli Meshnikoff gets into the microbe moment for microbiome and microbial genetics through history is he started a fad diet. And if you know anything about microbiome, is there a lot of stuff about dieting and your microbiome? And in America, there's tons of fad diets, one of which that started maybe five to 10 years ago was yogurt, eating tons and tons and tons of yogurt because it's going to Fill your gut with so many yummy microbes that are going to just cure you of every ailment that ever was with your gut microbiome. I wish that was true. Yeah, me too. Well, if you jumped on that train five or ten years ago and drank a bunch of yogurt, you were kind of like, yeah, this doesn't really seem to be fixing anything. While yogurt does have a number of health benefits, this fad diet was started a hundred years earlier by Eli Metchnikoff. He became obsessed with yogurt and fermented milk because he believed the lactic acid producing bacteria, which is all those probiotics, all those yogurt companies try to convince you it's in their yogurt and it's going to heal you of everything. They are inside yogurt. So he believed that a diet that consisted of consuming many fermented milk products would prevent the growth of other microbes that produce poisons to the body. And That's still sort of what people are saying today when they're trying to get you to buy their $7 Greek yogurt on the shelf. I mean, in theory, it would it works. Yeah, I mean, lactic acid bacteria are definitely probiotics. They definitely have been shown to give benefits, but they will definitely not cure you of every ailment that you've had as the marketing and advertising companies inside the grocery store like you to believe. Right. And so the whole issue is, are those microbes alive by the time they reach your intestines? Are they even going to engraft or are they just transient? But that's a whole completely different topic that we're not going to get into today. Mm-hmm. For sure. But I just think it's really interesting that Eli Metchenkoff was on this fad diet 100 years before it became a fad diet in America. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right, let's bustle over to the 20th century. 
Next is Francis Crick. Oh, and if you don't know his name, you probably should. He was born June 8th, 1916, and he passed away July 28th in 2004, I believe. Another death day. Well, an interesting thing that I found about him was he helped develop magnetic mines during World War II. What? He did what? We said that again? He helped develop magnetic mines at World War II. Okay, so that's exactly what I thought you said, but I still have no clue what you're talking about. That was just what he first studied, and then he went into biology afterwards. It's uh, During that time period, you really had to focus. If you're going to go into science, I think, around that time, you had to focus on something that had to aid in the war, or else you were probably going to get drafted. Mm, yeah, that should be out. He was instrumental in figuring out the structure of DNA. Right, right. <clears throat> Him and Sir Watson stealing the notebook from one Rosalind Franklin. Yeah. So when he met James Watson, it was known that DNA was involved in heredity determination. They just didn't know what it looked like or the structure of it. Mm -hmm. But Watson and Creek used X-ray diffraction studies and pictures from Rosalind Franklin and constructed a model of DNA, which ended up being a double helix, which is a phosphate, sugar, and a base. The bases are either adenine, threonine, cytosine, or guanine, if I remember correctly. Yep. Biochemistry. When you separate each strand, you can, they, you can use those single strands as templates to make others, a.k.a. replication. And their model also stated that the base has acted as a code to be translated into proteins. Mm -hmm. Francis Creek, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins ended up winning the Nobel Prize for determining the mo molecular structure of DNA. Hmm, it seems like there's a name left out there. Oh, well, I'll get into that. Mm -hmm. Don't you worry, but that's going to come in a little bit. And this wasn't the only thing that Francis was did. He eventually was able to show what a codon was. Mm -hmm. And if those people that don't know, a codon is a sequence of three bases in your DNA, and that ends up encoding to an amino acid. Which and, eventually leads to protein. Right. So yeah, codon amino to amino acid, this is the language of our cell. How we get from DNA to proteins. He also helped research which codons coded for which amino acids. So that ends Francis Creek. Cool, cool, cool. So what's your next date? Frederick Sanger, who was born August 13th in 1918. And he actually has two Nobel Prizes in chemistry. Whoa. First, Which I, only like a handful of people have won more than one Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, I believe the first one was... His earlier work when he worked with proteins. And in 1943, he was actually interested in determining the structure of protein. Mm -hmm. And this actually, his work aided in resulting the determination of the structure of insulin. Oh, that's important. That's very important. Super relevant. Yep. And in the 1960s, he's like, you know what? Let me change this. Let me go into nucleic acids. Mm, okay. Transgential, but related. Yep. So in the 1970s, he began using DNA polymerase to make new strands of DNA. And this requires a primer that binds to a known region of DNA, which is pretty common to make today. But back in the day, that made early research hard because they didn't really know much about primers. This little thing that allows polymerase to make the complementary strand of DNA. And he assisted in developing the plus and minus system, mm. which generates DNA fragments of varying lengths that can be separated on a gel. And this DNA was randomly generated, and once separated, it can be read. <clears throat> and this was to figure out... Red as in the letters, though, let's just be clear, right? right. Red as in you can say A, C, T, G. Not red like this DNA says... You're going to grow up to be a doctor. Right. doesn't tell you a story. It's no, it's talking specifically the base pairs. Yeah. It's, were, it's like singing the alphabet. Yeah, and we're trying to figure out what those base pairs are. And this method was actually used to figure out most of a bacteriophage genome. Mm -hmm. And 
he and others further developed the method, adding inhibitor molecules incorporated into the DNA molecule randomly that they are making, that they're uh, the complementary strand they're making. And it uses four different ones, which ended the DNA chain with a specific nucleotide. And this allowed the sequences to be read on a gel with the sequence to be determined. This can tell you more specifically, all right, this is an adenine. This is supposed to be cytosine, threonine, guanine. So it's a lot more accurate. We're trying to figure out what's going on here. And they actually use this to determine the sequence of the human mitochondrial DNA. Which is how big? I don't think it's as big. So the lean theory is mitochondria. Well, it's just like a cell ate another cell. A cell organ, yeah. That cell just kind of kept that other cell alive. It didn't phagocytose it. It just kind of was like, hey, you want to hang out? And they're like, yeah, I'll hang out inside you. Well, and they're they, like, great, this is fun. They think it started as phagocytose and it just didn't well, die. Yeah, yeah, it didn't break it down. I guess I should be more clear. 16,500. Which? Base pairs. Isn't a lot. And that's because it should. I don't know. If you have to read 16,500 letters. Usually, some of the smallest bacteria are like a million so this is very 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 small yeah but i have a computer to read me the genome of the uh bacteria that i have their their bacterial genomes are between four and six million base pairs on average Mm -hmm. that's a lot more but i have a computer that reads it they had to read this by hand right off of a gel yep holy moly they had to take images of the gel and figure out the sequences based off of that oh thank you and you can also tell the position because, you know, if the longer the read, the further down the base pair is. So you can figure out not only what the, the letter is, but where in the DNA strand it is. Mm-hmm. This method is still used today. This, like, revolutionized gene sequencing. We were able to s- start figuring out what made genes, like, what is the sequence. And it's still used today, but it is limited because it, there's this what, maybe 5,000 base pairs you can test at any given time? I think it's less than that. I think it's like max 5,000, but I'm not 100% sure on that. For for a reference point to the microbiome, when we analyze the microbiome, bacterial microbiome, what we are actually doing is amplifying the 16S gene. The 16S gene is six, 1,500 base pairs in length. So this mitochondria is 16,000. We're talking 1,500. So 10% of that is what we're amplifying when we're doing microbiome studies. When we do Sanger sequencing, it has to be on an isolate, on a single microbe, right. not your microbiome. And typically, when you do a Sanger sequencing, it's quick, it's dirty. You get about 700, 800 base pairs, maybe 1,000 base pairs of usable DNA. And from that, you can take all those ACTGs and throw it on the computer and say, computer, can you turn this into a word? And the computer says, here, this is what your microbe is. This is how we'll identify it based on the alphabet you gave me. Right. And it's still called Sanger sequencing today, but it's been updated, thankfully. So what it is is you're you're elongating, you know, you're making a copy of DNA. You're still using these base pairs that randomly end the strand. However, it goes through a capillary and a computer reads the piece that randomly ended because it's color coded. And instead of running on a gel, you got a computer's like, all right, the smaller fragments come first, the longer fragments come end. Here's the color system. It equals this, this, and this, and it spits out a sequence. It's like, here you go. Mm-hmm. You don't have to run on a gel. You got a computer to read for you. Bing, bang, boom. Yep. And that sequence correlates. So basically what you can do is you can tell, go to a different computer once you get that sequence, pop it into a database and tell me what character this is. It'll tell you what, based on that seven, 800 base pair, 1,000 base pairs, if you're lucky, what microbe that you have. But again, we're only at one microbe at this point. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've actually used this to figure out uh, contamination in bacterial stocks in my last job, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great, great, easy, dirty way to figure out if you're working with one strain or multiple strains or the right strain. Right. Or species or taxa, however you want to say that. Still a little dated, but it's still tried and true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we'll be using Sanger sequencing for a while. Oh, and yeah. it only is like $4. $4 it's wicked cheap. Pop. It's wicked cheap. Wicked cheap. Wicked cheap. I eat like a dunks. <laughs> B-
This week's episode of The Micro Moment is brought to you by Zymo Research. Accurate and reproducible microbiome analysis relies on well-defined mock community standards as well as optimized methods for sample collection, nucleic acid extraction, library prep, and bioinformatics. Check out Zymo's complete microbiome workflow at zymoresearch.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H dot com. Anywho, what year are we in? Uh, I just finished 1918. I'm about to go into 1920. Who was born in 1920, the year that women were allowed to vote in America? Rosalind Franklin. All right. This is... Our first woman. Yep. Yeah, woman in science. And circling back to Francis Creek, too. Dumb, dumb. Yep. So Rosalind Franklin was born July 25th of 1920. She was a chemist and received her PhD from Cambridge University. Did we go there? Or we go to Oxford? Oxford. Oh, we went to Oxford. Yes. There's so many people upset with us right now. <laughs> no, we went to Oxford, not Cambridge. Okay. University. If it makes anyone feel any better, I think Harvard and MIT is the same thing, too. <laughs> Universities. So much hate. Anyways. <laughs> so she she had nothing to do with DNA at this point in time. This was identifying microstructures in coal and how they at affected the performance of the coal. She was able to determine, based off of the carbon composition, and uh, how big the pores were, and it actually allowed for grades of coal to come out. And she did this by X-ray crystallography studies. So pretty much what that is, is you shoot X-rays, they bounce off an object, and based off that, diffraction you get an image so basically it's the origin story of almost every other superhero that we know of yes but she didn't she didn't come out as a superhero right no well she is she is a superhero that's and like, right yeah and x-ray crystallography this is still used it's used to determine the actual structures of protein we can make theoretical models of protein but generally x-ray crystallography is used to determine the actual structure of it yeah but today when it's used it requires some safety i mean yes protocols that were not around in the 1950s 40s right and her work on detailing carbon structures formed the basis of developing carbon fibers and heat resistant material well yeah but eventually she went over to King's College in London to work on DNA. And this is where she worked with Maurice Wilkins. Remember, he oh, got... Oh, it's all coming together now. Yeah, he got the Nobel Prize. And their relationship soured quickly from what it sounds like a miscommunication where he thought they were working together and she interpreted him as saying that she and other research assistants were going to do the research. So I think he felt a little left out and maybe ego bruised. I mean, probably she was right. And then when she discovered something cool, he was like, no, no, I was just kidding. This is, we did this from the beginning. We're friends. Yeah. And she's like, no, we're not friends. <laughs> we're not friends. And she discovered DNA had a wet and dry form. What does that mean? So DNA has... Is that like when my wine's dry? No, it's nothing wet. like that. Mine is always wet. So DNA has three forms. There's A, B, and Z. Z, I believe, is a theoretical f confirmation that it can become, but I don't think it happened or it has been seen in nature. So it's it's a, it's a quote unquote theoretical. So B is what we see most of the time, the B form. And the only difference I think is A is when there's 75% of the moisture is dried up and from the sample. And I think the double helix actually turns tighter. So you have more uh, loops mm -hmm. really sense. per when turn. When things are dry, they shrink. Yeah. So she's working on DNA, and she's able to determine that both structures have a helical structure. Mm -hmm. And Watson and Creek, they actually didn't pick this up. They were shown one of her pictures by Maurice Wilkins, as well as some unpublished work she submitted to the Medical Research Council. 
And that's what they use for the basis of their so model. So he's the one who stole it. Yes, that's my understanding. Mm. Now, probably we should just do a whole podcast on this whole fiasco. It's like one of the biggest fiascos in modern scientific history. It, it really is. Like, I think it would be an interesting dive. Yeah, let's do it. And so, like I said, Watson and Creek published their findings without acknowledging uh, Rosalind Franklin. Ooh. But Creek eventually admitted later on that she was very close to realizing the correct structure of DNA. He said that she was two steps away of f- figuring everything out. Mm. So also Watson published a paper or an autobiography and he really reamed into her character, which I don't know if they even met. <laughs> and Creek and even Wilkins kind of said, this is not her character. It's like, dude, calm down. I mean, it's fine, I guess, because Watson just ruined his own um, name later in life. Yeah, he everyone was, knows he's a- He was a very racist. Yeah. Um, very sexist. Not a great, great human being. I'm not 100%, but I think his, pull, uh, his Nobel Prize may have been pulled from him. Yoink. But this did not stop- Rosalind Franklin, she had no idea this pub- this publication occurred, but she kept going. She moved on to work on virus structures. And as an example, her diffraction pattern showed that the tomato mosaic virus, um, it has RNA instead of DNA, but it was within the wall of protective protein. So mm. she's showing this capsid, which is a common structure in viruses. Yeah. And her expertise was recognized by the Royal Institute because they asked her to make large-scale viruses in the 1958 World's Fair. Like, for show? For show. For show, like yeah. a diagram. or Yeah. I mean, she was, she was known, like, in circles, and she established a lot of colleagues who really respected her. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> in her 16 years as a researcher, she published 16 articles. Articles on coal, five on DNA, and twenty-one on viruses. Nice. Wait, and so she, she the place she published the least in is the one she's known the most for. Yes. Huh. Just all this controversy, but that, maybe one that, day I'll be a famous plant pathologist. <laughs> maybe based on my five publications in that field. It's so strange how like this is her like right. You when you hear her name, she's also always associated with DNA, but she did so much more. Yeah, and poor virology always gets squashed to the bottom until there was a pandemic, and then everyone hates them. Mm-hmm. But they're such an essential part of life. So essential, and they're she, gonna save the world someday. I think they may they may replace antibiotics. We don't know. I mean, they're gonna replace antibiotics for some use cases. Yeah. And unfortunately, her career didn't last longer than 16 years because she passed away from complications of cancer. But that being said, without her her X-ray crystallography expertise, Watson and Creek may never have figured out the structure of DNA. Mm-hmm. Just like Robert Koch would never have got to germ theory without Jacob Henley. Right. Just bring him back around. We got to give... Give some some props to those that came before us. I'll say. Which is basically his whole podcast. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I'll say she's a bad mama jam because all this happened, but she kept on trucking afterwards. Mm-hmm. She kept on doing her research. Yeah. Go girl. All right. We're going to July 15th, 1928, to one New Yorker who I'm sure you all are somewhat familiar with if you do any sort of microbial genomics work. And that would be Mr. Carl Woes. He rearranged the tree of life. No big deal, right? Uh, So previous to Carl Woes, people believe that there were two domains of life. They're like, there are eukaryotes and there are prokaryotes, which is like, yes, we still believe that today. But he was like, these things encompass everything. And that there is nothing else that exists. And just so people know, eukaryotes 
are plants, fungi, animal, birds, humans, basically like anything that you see biologically is probably a eukaryote. Plus they're microscopic eukaryotes, like all little fungi, all little spores that you can't see. Those are all also eukaryotes. Protozoa. Protozoa. A lot of things are floating in the marine that you can't see. And then prokaryotes are all the microscopic organisms like bacteria. But Carl Wolves was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's hold up for a second. <laughs> really? You went there? I went there. And he was like, let's split the prokaryotes into two distinct lineages. And this, my friends, is how we got archaea. And archaea usually get the spotlight, the limelight, the highlight. When we were talking about discussing extreme environments, they are often put into buckets of all being extremophiles. They were the ones that you usually hear about out in Yellowstone and hydrothermal vents, living in volcanoes. Usually people, this is what we associate with archaea. But actually, you can find archaea everywhere, anywhere. Can find it in your gut. Find it in your gut. Find it in your soil. Find it in those extreme environments. But they are the primary organisms that we do find in these extreme environments. So it does make sense that that's usually what we associate with them. But you can find them in many other places as well. In the mid-90s, so we're moving up quite a bit here, he published the first complete genome of an archaean called Methanococcus genoschi where he stated that archaea are more closely related to eukaryotes than to bacteria. Whoa. Whoa. So this whole domain of life that was clumped in with bacteria is that different from all the other bacteria. And he also made another really important discovery. So he did this through looking at ribosomal RNA, which is the piece that generally when we're talking about studying the microbiome, in small portions in amplicon sequencing, we are studying this ribosome or we are sequencing this ribosomal RNA. But it's DNA. Yeah, specifically the DNA that makes up the ribosomal RNA. Exactly. So he was the first person that proposed that ribosomal RNA is the ideal gene to look at evolutionary distance and is an ideal gene to be a marker for identifying and differentiating microbes. And he said this because this gene has a very slow mutation rate, as in it's relatively conserved amongst all organisms. And many organisms that belong to the same group will have very similar genomic sequences in this small gene. It's universal, as in it's found in all organisms and performs the same function in all organisms. It's essential. It's not going to be destroyed. It's not going to be transferred through horizontal gene transfer. It's not going to be lost through any source of mutation because the cell will just die. Yeah. It's that thing that takes those codons and slaps on an amino acid. Call back. So as we said, it's essential and it's central to a lot of cell processes, like John just said, with amino acids and converting them into proteins. So these genes are not going to jump around. They're not going to move to different species. Microbes are going to hold on to them. Everyone's going to hold on to these genes because they're so essential to their life. And he developed what is called RNA fingerprinting. So this is when you sequence fragments of the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is usually associated with bacterial and archaea identification. In eukaryotes, it's the 18S. That's what it is. Um, so it's slightly bigger um, is what, what the, the number means. And he looked at more than 100 organisms with this one gene in a time before we had databases to do this for us. So he's like looking at it. With his eyes? Um, yeah, usually gels. Real old school method. Yeah. So one day he found a sequence that was very different from the other sequences than all the other bacteria. And he found the same difference from a sequence from every extremophile that he found. So he was f coupling these two different patterns, if you will, into d to these two very distinct patterns into groups. And through this observation, it kind of led him and his postdoc, George Fox, to conclude that this was a different domain of life. It was so different from every other bacteria sequence that he had, he couldn't put it in the same bucket. It needed his own bucket. And he called this bucket Archaea. 
And now we use the 16S gene, which he used for RNA fingerprinting here in most of our amplicon sequencing, most of our microbiome studies. Basically, if you read a paper on microbiome from 2008 to 2015, probably, you're talking amplicon sequencing. And from 2015 to 2020, probably half to two thirds are still amplicon sequencing. Yeah. Maybe more, probably more. That's the amplicon sequencing. That's what I was using to determine if my culture stocks were what they were. Yeah. And this is basically what I got my PhD in. So I want to end, as I ended before, with Jacob Henley, I think, with a quote from Mr. Carl Wolves. And he says, Our task now is to resynthesize biology, put the organism back into its environment, connect it again to its evolutionary past, and let us feel that complex flow that is organism, evolution, environment united. The time has come for biology to enter the nonlinear world. I wish I could speak that elegantly. Oh, me too. I couldn't even say the whole quote without messing it up. Just crazy how he changed the domains of life. He so rearranged the tree much. of life. I mean, what a legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. If you ever look up pictures of him, he looks like a total grandfather. Like. Yeah, he looks so sweet. He does. Carl Woes. My next birthdays are 1935 and 36. Okay, you're up. 1935. So we're still pre-World War II. Yes. In birthdays. And this is my last one, actually. Okay. Do it. This is Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer. Herbert Boyer was born July 20th. July 10th in 1936, and Stanley Cohen was born February 17th, 1935. Both met in 1972. Cohen was a Stanford professor working on ways to isolate genes and clone them into E. coli, and Boyer came from the University of California, San Francisco, and he discovered that an enzyme that cuts DNA at specific sequences. So it had been known that Bacteria had plasmids since the late 1950s, and bacteria can transfer these between each other. Uh, transferring beneficial genes, probably the most uh, well-known is antibiotic resistance, actually. They were able to splice a piece of DNA into a plasmid and insert it into a bacteria, which copied the DNA when it replicated. They were actually able to do this quickly. And so they what they did is they took this enzyme, they cut the plasma in half, they took a piece of DNA, and they threw it in there, and then they put it into a microbe. The initial experiments showed that they could cut open the plasma, like I said, uh, from one bacteria, insert a gene from a different bacteria, and then close that plasma, resulting in what is known as a recombinant DNA, or DNA coming from different sources. When they were able to insert it into E. coli, that was the first genetically modified organism. Bum, 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 and years of controversy to follow. Well. Including a whole Star Trek episode. Right. Well, several Star Trek episodes. Several Star Trek episodes from Next Gen to A Strange New World. Right. So I don't think the OG had anything with GMOs. Yes, it did. Oh, it did? Yeah. Oh, see, I didn't watch a lot of the OG because. That's where Khan came from originally. Khan? Khan. Really? Yes. With the GMO? Yeah, he was genetically modified. He was a superhuman. But let's so not dive too much into Star Trek. As we could, though. Yes. We certainly could. But I put a question mark after the first genetically modified organism because I, I guess it's what's the definition of genetically modified because... We're going to be arguing over that for like ever. Well, so... To whoever wins the legal battles, right? That's just a legal question. The, the fungal species that produced penicillin, they ended up shooting it with x-rays and made it produce even more... Right. It's a muted, yeah, a mutation. Is that a genetically modified organism? Can you classify that as a genetically modified organism or is it that you have to insert genes specifically? I don't know. Well, yeah, I think everyone just puts a different label on it and whatever field or audience is going to accept. Mm -hmm. This opened up the doors of making or using microbes and pretty much making them factories, producing substance, substances it doesn't do naturally. And they invented a, w a way to easily make things like human growth hormone, insulin, clotting factor for hemophiliacs, uh, you name it. And this, they ended up receiving three patents from it. And there's over like uh, 
140 applications of those patents today. There's so many things that this allows us to do now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not all microbes are easily transformable. It just so happens that E. coli is like the easiest one. It's the most researched. Yeah. Yep. They're the, he's the favorite E. coli. Yeah. Poster child. But how does this apply to the microbiome? My master's thesis, I inserted a gene that affected bile acids, and I was able to show that one microbe in the gut microbiome was able to affect bile acid levels or right. the types of bile acids. So, all right. So, what do you have for us next? Okay. So, hold on to your butts because this one's a little bit of a wild ride. We're going to talk about one Carrie Mullis. His birthday was December 28th, 1944. But he died on August 7th, 2019 of pneumonia. So we put him in here in our July, August birthday, death day celebration of life of famous microbial genomesis because he's got an interesting story to tell. And I think he definitely kind of ties in with everything that we've been talking about today. So Kerry Mullis, kind of a crazy dude, I think. He wrote an autobiography which I think you always have to be a little crazy to write your own autobiography. Yeah. Yeah. But he titled this book. Do you know the title of his autobiography? I'm not sure I'm familiar with this person's work in general. Oh, I mean, you are. You've used this person's work. Okay. Yeah. He titles his autobiography, Dancing Naked in the Mindfield. Fantastic <laughs> title. That's great. But is it the title for an autobiography of a famous scientist who helped us get to microbiome research? Well, I don't know. But good for him. I like it. It's bold. I would say so. It breaks the mold of... It's sassy. It is. Yeah. I just like, just a picture the title is like him naked and it's like raining and he's in like a World War II minefield and even though it's a minefield but like minefield like it's about to blow up and he's just like dancing like the mines are not even gonna blow up and he's just butt naked it's just like his butt but like old person butt you know like because he wrote it at the end of his life choosing not to picture the old man butt I mean, like the minefield is like the profile of a brain and a head. So it's like inside his head. He's in. It's like all meta. Yeah. 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 Anywho, this guy was a pretty cray cray guy. Famous genius scientist that revolutionized science and molecular biology for sure. But he was also some of some of the other crazy things he did. Um, he was like, you know, LSD is really cool and we should all take it. Uh, and he was like, OJ Simpson, like, I'll be on your legal defense. That sounds cool, man. And he was also like, mm, maybe climate change is not a thing, which I'm sitting inside my house. It's 150 degrees right now. It's a thing. So he has a bit of controversy in his history. Oh, for show. Sure. He would totally be on Dirty Deeds of Bad Biologists. Oh, and he was also started a company or he's a creator of a company that infused jewelry, jewelry with celebrities' DNA. Blood things that Angelina Jolie and Billy Bob Thornton were wearing of each other's blood. I have no idea. This is the first time I heard of it. And I was like, that's so dumb. But I bet you it's a pretty penny to get. I'm sure it is. Oh, in one more terrible word, science I don't even know how to phrase this. He was a denier. He did not believe that HIV caused AIDS. Oh. He was like, no, nah, that's not real. Even after it was proven. I mean, I don't know. It, at one point he did. I guess I don't know if his mind changed later when he was writing his autobiography about being naked in a minefield. But, you know, everyone has their faults, and maybe he changed his mind later in life. I'm not entirely sure. But the man did bring something to science that I think anyone who's worked inside a microbiology, genetics, medicine, biology, or evolutionary lab has come to know and love and use and use often. What is that? So, in 1993, Kerry Mullis was the recipient of the Nobel Prize for in chemistry for his 1985 invention of PCR, which is probably... The second most famous three-letter word in biology after DNA. Yep. Polymerase chain reaction. Exactly. And so this is a technique we use in the lab all the time. I use it all the time. And it's very beautiful and simple, unlike the man who invented it, who 
clearly has some complications. So PCR is the standard method of replicating DNA. I think of it sort of like um, a construction zone, if you will. And it should sound familiar to anyone who's ever taken a COVID test in 2020. Uh, in 2021, we got some of the rapid tests and you did it at home. But a lot of the COVID tests in 2020 is when they shoved something up your nose or down your throat. And then they brought it to the lab and they did a PCR test. So this is what they were doing. They were amplifying a segment of the SARS-CoV-2 gene to identify whether or not you have this virus. And so it has three main materials, this construction zone, this PCR technique. And you have to gather them up, and you put them in one little spot, and then you go to our friend Tack Polymerase, and you say, build me a building. So what are the materials? First, you need to have your template, your DNA segment. So this is what they're collecting when they're shoving that thing up your nose or inside your throat. This is your template, your blueprint, the thing that you are trying to build from. And then you need two primers. One goes in one direction, one goes in the opposite direction. These are short segments. Um, John talked about them earlier when we were talking about Sanger. Yes. Friedrich Sanger. So these are primers that you usually develop or you create based on a known portion of the genome that you want to amplify. And they're complementary to your template. Then you need nucleotides. These are the building blocks, the puzzle pieces, the bricks to build the building of your DNA. And then you need an enzyme. And this enzyme is TAC polymerase. This is your workhorse. Also derived from a microbe. Yep. But that's a micro moment for another day. For it. And then you have to put it in what we now call a thermocycler, but in Carrie Mollis' time, it was a water bath. It's like one of those hot spring places where you can jump into all the different waters and like some are hot and some are cold and some are somewhere in between. So this is what a thermocycler does. It regulates the temperature rapidly and changes it to mimic the biology of DNA replication. And in the end, you're able to make billions of copies from one fragment from a small fragment of DNA. I'd say thermocycler is probably as prevalent in a biology lab as a microwave is in a kitchen in America. Uh, that's fair to say. I got one in my lab right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, some places have two. But fundamentally, all they're doing is regulating temperature. And Carrie Mollis was attributed as the discoverer of this process, polymerase chain. But get this. This is my fun fact about Carrie Mollis. His manuscript describing PCR was rejected from not one, but two top journals. Can you guess which journals he was rejected from? I don't know. We got Nature Science and Cell at the top three. Mm -hmm. um, nature and Science. Yes, sir. His PCR paper, his manuscript on PCR, which revolutionary the field of biotechnology, biology, microbiology, forensic genomics, and regular biology, environmental biology. I mean, basically everything. All biology. All biology was rejected from the two top journals, Science and Nature. Just goes to show... It ain't all that on a bag of potato chips getting those journals. And so that basically wraps up what we're going to talk about on July, August, birthday, death day, Jubilee podcast that surmises the history of microbial genomics. But first, I have two shout outs. One is to Dolly. Dolly the sheep was also born in July 5th, 1996. And if you don't know who Dolly is, she was a Finn Dorset sheep that was created from the egg of a Scottish blackface sheep. Why do we care? Because she was the first cloned mammal. And she was named after Dolly Parton, not because she could bleat in the same tones, angelic tones that people have come to love from Dolly Parton's voice. No, sir, she was named after Dolly Parton because... She was cloned from the mammary t uh, cell, right? Exactly. Of a sheep. And mammary means boobs. Boobs. And Dolly Parton was kind of known more for her boobs than her singing. Hmm. Debatable. Yeah, I don't know. I can't sing any Dolly Parton songs, but I can picture. Mm. I mean, that's because you're not big into country. That's true. That's true. So I also found this other fun fact, which I just wanted to share with you. Dolly was the mother of six lambs. Six. So this cloned mammal reproduced six times. Her lambs were called Bonnie, Sally, Rosie, Lucy, Darcy, and Cotton. Aww. And she was euthanized in her sixth year because they found a number of tumors. But 
If you would like to visit Dolly, she is stuffed and encased at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, which we've gone to and we went and we took a picture of her. And she died on February 14th on Valentine's Day, 2003. And... I just, I looked this up because I was interested, so maybe you are too. Dolly died when she was six years old. She was euthanized. The average sheep lives 10 to 12 years. So she died maybe half of the life she could have lived if she didn't get tumors. But on the flip side, anyone who owns sheep for commercial use generally euthanize or kills their sheep at about this age anyways, because once they get older than six, they stop producing all the stuff that people like to get from them and sell. Hmm. So she actually lived a pretty generic commercial life. And my second shout out is to my man, John, whose birthday is also in July. And we look forward to his microbial genomic discoveries in the future years. So if you are still with us at the end of this podcast and you would like to wish John a happy birthday, you can do so by sending us a DM on Instagram or Twitter at MicrobiGals. If Twitter's not your thing, you can also email us at MicrobiGals at gmail.com. And we're really looking forward to having you join us next time where we're going to talk about Zoe and Vile and our own journey into understanding our microbiome. So as always, feed your minds, feed your guts, make your microbes, love you lots. Bye. Bye.